Okay, so the final thing you wanted to talk about was kind of all of the nerve pains that can presumably not just wreak havoc down here from a pain and you know suffering standpoint, but also from a diagnostic standpoint. Yes, yes. So, so many people present with numbness, tingling, weakness, or pain uh, in the upper limb. And it can be, it can start from the neck where the, the nerve roots exit and travel under our collarbone, through the brachial plexus, in between the scalene muscles, and then travels through our armpit and then comes down in through the arm and into the hand. And the, and they, it can be confounding. A, a, a perfect example of how confounding it can be is a, is a, now more commonly known, although it's, I wouldn't call it rare, but it's uncommon, um, is Parsonage Turner syndrome. It's a fascinating study in that whole process from the neck down. And the other term for it is a brachial neuritis, as in brachial plexus neuritis. And it's an inflammation of those nerves. We think it's probably viral related because mm. there's usually a viral prodrome associated, but it doesn't have to be. But it's an acute, dramatic onset of pain all through here, and then some what we call mixed plexopathy, some mixed bag of palsy, weakness, numbness, and it can be in multiple different nerves. It can even lead to, and one of the most common presenting ways is long thoracic nerve, which is part of the brachial plexus and you get scapular winging. So you, you lift your arm up and it just falls down because your scapula cannot support the shoulder and arm weight because the muscle of the, 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 um, of the shoulder girdle cannot support that. And it's super cool. And, and it, and it presents as a mix. So it, it affects multiple nerves because those nerves are more, common up here and then they diverge into the different um nerves which i still you know you remember in med school trying to learn the brachial plexus and it was it was brutal because it's really complicated okay so so these are people who show up and they you you certainly couldn't attribute what they're experiencing to any one thing that's the point like you, you it's not like they have one or two discs that could be bulging and causing that symptom. It's not like they could have even transected their long thoracic nerve like a woman who has a mastectomy. You're always looking yes. out for that post mastectomy. It's like they would have to have six lesions simultaneously. Exactly, and it just doesn't happen except with that. So that's a that's a great lead into what the majority. By the way, is that just a self limited thing, or do you give these people steroids? Steroids, or? yeah. And uh, the neurologist now, uh, they make the diagnosis if you send them to them and we give steroids. And most of them recover completely. A few have some residual deficits for mm. forever, at least long term. Um, okay, so then that takes us to people presenting. I have a ton of patients who present with shoulder pain and they may have a little something on their MRI that they may have brought in with them. But the, that shoulder pain is actually coming from their neck. From And so then I'll have someone who will present with carpal tunnel syndrome, but it's, there's a little extra stuff going on. Maybe some ulnar nerve in the little finger, maybe some shoulder pain, maybe some arm pain. And the cool thing about diagnostically speaking is an intrinsic shoulder problem, such as a rotator cuff tear or inflammation, bursitis, et cetera usually travels down underneath the, the pain, underneath the, del the big deltoid muscle, but almost never goes below the elbow. So if I see pain that's in the shoulder going below the elbow, I'm thinking maybe neck or maybe something else. Then um, secondarily, if someone complains of, let's say they come in and they say, yeah, I've got numbness here, but I've also got some numbness on the back of the hand. The radial nerve is rarely involved in in association with carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel uh, some and oh yeah my neck's been really stiff just subtle little cues that you can get by speaking with them well they could have something that i know you know about and that can be called double crush and that is where you get pinching of the nerve in the neck maybe through a disc maybe through a foraminal osteophyte that narrows that little canal it passes through and then because the 
axoplasmic flow or the the nerve tube dis, the, the communication of it is disrupted or compressed it renders them more uh, susceptible to milder compression down at the carpal tunnel mm. or the cubital tunnel at the elbow so they're getting a double crush now for those i don't treat necks other than treating them you know initially with some pt and maybe steroids or something and i refer those out but Many patients will then see a neck surgeon who will say, well, you don't really need surgery. Yes, I think you do have double crush, but you can go ahead and treat. I can go ahead and treat. Let's say they have moderate carpal tunnel. I can do a carpal tunnel release and they'll still get better. They won't, may not get all the way better. The, most of their carp, mm. all their carpal tunnel will go away, but they'll still have some of the upper you know, nerve pain. So the double crush phenomena is real and true. And uh, that's another category of patient. Then there's the weird lower cervical um, that I just learned not that long ago from a really smart uh, nerve, a neck surgeon is it's pretty consistent that the lower level, the C7 nerve root level, if they have compression down there, then that, that goes deep under the scapula and gives them that deep scapular plane. And, and the problem there, and what's been so great for me to learn this later in my career is I often would see patients will develop scapulothoracic bursitis, and you can clearly get that from lifting weights, especially if you've been out of the weight room for a long time. You go back into it, you can get a lot of upper trapezius, mm -hmm. periscapular, rhomboid-type pain from overuse, and those, so, those overlap. So you really have to do the diagnostic work and talk to the patients and listen to the patients to, to differentiate that. And then, of course, in our exam, we can, we can see that too. Um, and... I think that's more or less what I would want to say. The uh, one patient that I would, I think illustrates this, how, how complicated it can be was someone who had a bad shoulder fracture, was treated in the emergency department, put into a sling, but then also maybe told to do pendulum exercises. Well, it was an unstable fracture, very unstable. And so the weight of our arm, I mean, I'm sure you've did that in general surgery way more than me. The weight of the arm is enormous if you have to amputate an arm for a tumor or something. And all that weight pulling on an unstable fracture, well, that put tremendous traction on the nerves. Mm. Ended up killing his ulnar and median nerve. Ulnar and median nerve were out. He came in, his hand was like that. He couldn't, he couldn't uh, oppose his thumb. He couldn't do anything. And I, all I had left to work with was the radial nerve innervated, which are the wrist extensors and the, the supinators. And I was able to transfer some things and give him back some pretty good function. Um, and, but it was all just due to traction. What was, the, what was that length of time it took for, the, for those nerves to under traction die? Yeah, it was fast, super fast. Oh, Probably man. within, uh, I saw him eight weeks post-op, so he was fully there, but he started saying he started losing hand function at about three weeks, within three weeks of the fracture. And no one picked up on this? Uh, no. Yeah, it was, it was pretty tragic. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, should, so, do you want to yeah. do an exam yeah. and kind of yeah, go over some of that. those things as well yeah. before yeah. we wrap up? Okay, yeah. great. Let's do that. Okay. Okay, so we talked about kind of the nerve compressive neuropathies, nerve injuries that can happen. And so this is very brief, but just to kind of go through the route of the nerves for your viewers. And so if we look at your neck, we want to say maybe you have some neck stiffness, maybe not. But we look and see and we say this side, it goes, let's, uh, I'm going to take it less. Let's say it only goes to 30 degrees horizontal rotation, whereas this side goes farther. Then we say, oh, maybe there's some asymmetry there. Any tightness and asymmetry in the neck can actually cause pinching of those nerves coming out of your neck and give a lot of neck pain, but also pain down there. You can go ahead and extend your neck that way. That's great. And then chin to your chest. So I want to just basically look at that. The last one of that is just horizontal rotation that way and that way. And that gives me a sense of maybe there's a component of that. Then, you know, we send patients to neurologists to, to look at the nerves, the function. They do two kinds of testings and electromyography and then they do nerve conduction. But we can do a poor man's test quite well, poor man's neurologic exam, just like this. So we know the nerves come out of the neck, they go through between the anterior and middle scalene muscles, these, these secondary respiratory muscles that are up here, and they pass us through there. And if I roll through there and you have a disc, you will say, ooh, that's sending 
that's going down to my left arm, my right arm, both arms. So it's a real easy palpation of those irritated nerves. Then we look at that, they're coming under the collarbone, they're coming down through deep to your pectoralis here, and then coming in through the axilla. The next place I can get access to those nerves is here medially. We know the ulnar and median nerve and, well the radial nerve comes over here, but the ulnar and median nerves right here. So I'll palpate right up against your bone and see, and that too, oh yeah, that's definitely giving me stuff here. If, if you tell me that is giving you numbness and tingling to there or to your thumb, then when I get down here, I know that it's not just carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel. I know it's got to be some component coming from your neck. It's a very simple, easy way. Anything above the elbow is irritated from up here. Anything below it could be both. Um, the, and we almost never, from your neck, we almost never just see a pure ulnar neuropathy just coming from your neck. Usually there's something else, like a little radial nerve, a little medial nerve, something else. So then we come down to your ulnar nerve. Let's use this elbow because it's better. So I want to, uh, I've already checked your motion, and then I feel your nerve in the groove there, the funny bone nerve, and yours is, as we said, pretty mobile. I can kind of pull it up over the edge, but it's not bad. Now I would tap on that lightly and see, does that cause electrical shocks? And does that give you, ooh, 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 I don't like that. Now a lot of us can have a little irritation, so we want to compare and see what you have. Secondly, I want to flex up and see what that nerve does. Now you have a very well-developed triceps. I have seen people who are super avid and that have these huge triceps and throwing athletes as well, where they are pressing, their triceps is overdeveloped here and it's pressing up against the nerve. So it's a different form of cubital tunnel syndrome. It's not really in the cubital tunnel, but I've seen that a lot in athletes. This ulnar nerve, I want to test and see what it's doing. If you're a throwing athlete and your nerve slips back and forth, you can get snapping nerve and it's really irritable. You can no longer feel the seams of your, uh, on, your, on your slider or your fastball and so that is often needs surgery and even the weakness of grip. Now we come down here and then I can press on that, I can flex it up and hold it. And if, if that starts to cause numbness and tingling in your hand, then that's a secondary. You will have already probably told me yeah, you know, I get this, I wake up with my hand on a nerve quite numb. And that's, we all tend to start out this way and end up this way. And the only problem there is that it, th that can happen to any of us, but if it's regular and frequent and lingering, or if we get it when we're typing or playing a, a piccolo or a, a cello, then, um, then, that's a, then that's a different issue and we need to look further. Lastly, coming down the form, there's, there's two more uh, nerves that we can look at. The ulnar nerve rarely is involved down here. It's almost always 98% of the time at the, at the elbow. The radial nerve comes out from under here. It's just the sensory terminal branch of the radial nerve that does so much good work for extending our wrist and our triceps and everything. And it goes down to here and provides sensation in this part of the hand. And we can tap on that and, and come down and then it will give electrical shocks down here. It can be very nerve-wracking. I've seen a lot of musicians with that. You have a loose uh, wristband on now. Some people wear heavy watches, heavy bracelets, and you can get that. Or if you've been arrested and they put the handcuffs too tight, you haven't been arrested recently. Not recently. Not recently, okay. And, uh, so, um, and so that will cause a lot of numbness there, really aggravating, so we look for that. And then the last one is the median nerve, which is here. This is the carpal tunnel. Now the most sensitive and specific test for carpal tunnel syndrome is just to put thumb pressure directly over that transverse carpal ligament. I'm effectively doing what you're doing when you're driving or maybe riding a, a cycling. I'm putting extra pressure. And you're gonna tell me if that causes numbness, tingling, pain sometimes, but mainly numbness and tingling in the median nerve distribution, that thumb, index, middle, and half the ring finger. And if it does, then that's golden. We know you have carpal tunnel syndrome. That's, that's, and then the others that we look for are these tunnel signs. I'll go along here and tap. And the nerve, if you have bad carpal tunnel, that median nerve can be irritable as it's lying in between these muscle, muscle uh, bellies. And so we can tap along there and you get a tunnel sign, and go, ooh, and it, and it sends electrical shocks. That's the second way we can test it. The third way is just to have you mimic what you would do and you, the Phelan's test where you hold them down like that and that reproduces this as well. The most one is, the most sensitive and specific is the one I already did, but those are other. And that's pretty much it for the, for the oh, there's one other component is we always want to look 
If you have winging of the scapula, you can do a push up against the wall. We can see if one side sticks out and that's that, that upper cervical uh, mm -hmm. nerve root, the long thoracic nerve. And that's really about it. Thank you.